I lost my youngest daughter, and it was never solved. You're not supposed to bury your child. If there was an investigation, it certainly wasn't documented, or at least it wasn't shown to us. Her body was just found under a bush. I'd like to know how she died, who did it, why did they do it. This poor woman has been waiting for an answer to what happened to her daughter. We're actually stepping into the energy field of a person. I feel awful. I automatically felt very nauseated, and we all had the same knots in our stomach. There's a lot of chaos. Losing a child, it, it's probably the most unnatural thing a person would go through in a lifetime. Your child's supposed to bury you. You're not supposed to bury your child. Is that it for you? For now. Hey, thank you. See you later. Okay. My name's Norma Matlock. I lost my youngest daughter when she was 22 years old. It's an everyday thought, wondering what happened to her, how she died. It, it just never goes away. Stephanie was 18 months younger than me, but we were totally opposite. She kind of had a little wild side to her that started coming out when she was probably about 12. As we grew older, my mom and dad divorced, and I just remember Stephanie taking it a little bit harder than I did. Stephanie started getting into drugs. I started noticing her behavior changes. You know, I'd talk to her, you're on drugs, get off, it's gonna kill you. She was a different person, it wasn't her, and I hated that. Stephanie had a long history of drug abuse. Uh, I don't think that's any secret. She was a, a, a real problem, always coming in to the office. Then she met Andreas. Andreas Goodrum was my sister's husband. He was supposedly a recovering drug addict. I worried for her safety with him because I had started hearing more and more and more things he had done. Goodrum is, was a very aggressive individual. And in 1981, uh, he was arrested as a juvenile for possession of stolen property. 1985, he was arrested for kidnapping girlfriend. 1986, possession of illegal drugs. 1988, reckless endangerment involving a struggle with police officers over a gun in Phoenix. 1989, an assault on Stephanie Prophet. He beat her up with a crowbar. The police were there. They arrested him. And with two or three days, he's out of jail, calling her crying. It was on and off, on and off. We'd had lots of trouble with him, off and on. The past employee of Andreas Goodrum came to me. He said that he observed him and on several occasions give Stephanie marijuana and crystal methamphetamine. Hi. They were married for a couple of years and they ended up divorcing, but then they were still kind of seeing each other off and on. Bye. I, I worried about it the whole time she was with him. On the 17th of August, Andres had told me that they had had a fight. She got out of the truck on Heckle Road. I drove out to Heckle Road. I looked around. I couldn't find anything. That was the last of her. It was in the newspaper. It was all over. I mean, everyone was looking for her. My mom was frantic, trying to call the sheriff's office. You know, we kind of thought we'd get cooperation, and they just kind of blew it off. We got the report about 33, 34 hours after she had turned up missing. Instead of calling us, they go out and try to find her. They don't find her. The search and rescue squad had no chance of finding her at this point because now the family had trampled all over her footprints. The dogs couldn't pick up her scent. They should have, they should have called us. Andres admitted that he was the last person to see her alive. That statement seems to be quite incriminating because how would you know that you're the last person to see her alive unless you were the first person to see her dead? What he was saying is that Stephanie had been drinking considerably. And now this is a guy that has a long record of being very hostile. 
decided to take her for a ride. That he told me that on their way out there, his lights went out and she got mad and got out of the truck. But what he was telling me, it didn't make any sense. Yet he was never, he wasn't questioned. We did go out and do a search of his residence, but it was after the fact, it was clean. So I thought, okay, I'll hire Manny. We went to the sheriff's office. We were totally open with him. He could have access to anything he wanted. Uh, we always appreciate any help we can get. If he could solve anything with this, it was fine with us. We looked at their file, and there's only a couple of pieces of paper in there. If there was an investigation, which I don't know, it certainly wasn't documented, or at least it wasn't shown to us. You know, he came in and made all these grandiose promises. We were telling the family the truth all along. He ended up uh, just taking the family for a ride for a bunch of money. It was hard to watch knowing that you have so much faith in law enforcement and you feel like they're going to protect you and your family and then they just kind of disregard you. We did our jobs and we did our jobs professionally and uh, they wanted to go somewhere else with it. And that's when I started documenting everything. I went through the discrepancies I found in Andreas's story. We started collecting anything that had her name on it or to do with the sheriff. We have copies of depositions that were taken, court hearings, transcripts. We also visited the scene and we did multiple searches attempting to find her out in the desert. I just knew something was wrong. Stephanie was missing 55 days before her body was found. I guess I was in shock, but I kind of expected it, you know, but I guess you're never really prepared. Her body was just found under a bush in, um, in a wash. You can see, like, her skull is kind of gone. Her hair was over in the tree here somewhere, her scalp. They swear that her body had been there the whole time. If you're lost in the desert, you're not gonna survive over a half a day. I've lived in the desert all my life, and if there's something to eat, the varmints and the critters are gonna, are gonna eat it. They're not gonna just tear off a piece and then just leave the rest of it. It doesn't make any sense. I don't think she was there the whole time. I personally don't think so. This is the autopsy, it's interesting. Richard Max at the autopsy, measuring her remains. The night of the autopsy, Richard Mack called me and said, well, I can tell you right now, the cause of death is going to be unknown. It was almost impossible to identify her body. It was undetermined as to the cause of death because of the decomposition. I said, I'm not going to accept that. Manny and Pat found a toxicologist in Bakersfield, California. This is the toxicology report. There was enough crystal meth in her hair that it could be lethal. And I think she was given a lethal dose of crystal meth with intent to kill her. I believe if this case from the beginning would have commenced in the standard or normal way of doing things, it wouldn't have gotten to the point that it did. The officers that worked this case were very honest, very hardworking, dedicated servants of the people of Graham County. This case was handled properly and professionally. It was a missing person. That's all it ever was classified as. And she was found out near the area where she had turned up missing to begin with. And I think the only way that there could be a definite conclusion would be for Andreas to confess. And of course, he's not around. He had uh, hepatitis C and AIDS, and he died. 20 years later, I'm just a totally different person. I can't trust people anymore. I have days I can't concentrate. Losing my child, I just, I mean, it just took a huge part of me away. She just seems empty, and she may never get that back. Obviously, I can't imagine losing a child. Knowing that your child was kind of treated like a piece of trash, I can't imagine. <laughs> <laughs> I 
My mom needs to have closure. I don't know why she had to die the way she died, you know, and that eats at you and it eats at you. So hopefully we'll get something, some kind of closure. When you don't have closure, it really is the kind of thing we love to do is come in and give comfort. The twins who literally coined the phrase twin tuition. This is what they forecasted on national radio nearly two years before the Twin Towers fell. But we are a bifurcated soul. That's one soul, one soul and two bodies. In two bodies. When we became aware of Stephanie Prophet, this really struck us. This poor woman for 20 years has been waiting for an answer to what happened to her daughter. What we initially do when we get a case, we'll sit side by side and we'll do our channeled or automatic writing on that person. Exactly. I, I feel like we should focus on her ex-husband first because I'm really vibing on this guy. What's his name, Andreas? It's a different kind of writing that our own handwriting is. Comes in almost uh, like an illuminated manuscript and our hands move across the paper without our conscious direction. Okay, I'm picking up kind of like sandy blonde, blonde hair, kind of brownish hair. I'm getting sort of um, at the leg build. Picking up an awful lot of negative energy here. I feel awful talking I about know, this guy. I know. It put her life in danger more than a few times. But I have chills again. This relationship was a train wreck. We're actually stepping into the energy field of a person. We have clairsentience, which is clear feeling, and we take on the suffering of others or we feel their pain. What I'm getting to is long-term drug use. And what I'm feeling like they mm -hmm. were together that night, yes, there was a lot of drug Clear audience is clear hearing where you can actually hear messages from spirit. It's funny, I'm getting a past life that the two of them had and she's saying uh, he was... Oh, that's interesting. I didn't expect uh, to see that. She's saying he was my father. Yeah. Okay, what I'm getting is 13th century. Uh -huh. 13th century. Um, it was a father, father, daughter, father, son, father, son connection. She uh -huh. was his son in that life. That's what I got. Okay, what I'm picking up is that the son killed the father in that life. And it was, what I'm getting is more, you want to hear what I'm getting? Poison. Yeah. Poisoned. Okay. It had to unfold, be and unfold just in the way it did, exactly in that way. She doesn't know why, but her, her guides are telling her that. She's saying, have confidence. Now she's speaking to mom. Have confidence, mom. Oh. <laughs> Don't despair. here as often as we can. That's my little girl right there. We're not sure of the date. I just chose the 18th because that's when I found out. I have never met the psychic twins. I believe in what they do. I'm, I'm interested to see how this will all turn out. I have a lot of faith in them. I'd like to know how she died, and I would like to know who did it. Why did they do it? And if they could just give me more insight on what went on, why? Well, I just well, wanted to let you know we're going to bring some closure today. Almost 20 years later, I feel that she's ready to, to get the story out there. And she wants us to know that we're strong enough to handle it now. The last time I was here, it was after they found her. 
And I, right now, just thinking about it, I can still remember the smell. See, these roads weren't out here before when she was missing. It's been about 15 years since I came to this area. It's just, mm -hmm. I just couldn't do the heartbreak of it. So are you, what are you feeling now? I don't know, I just kind of get angry when I think of her laying out here. Okay. This is the tree she was found by, and her body was laying here, mm -hmm. and uh, her scalp was up, hanging from the tree. And her arm was found up towards the bank. I'm really feeling murder here. I'm, there's, there's no, no accident question. with this. I'm feeling like he did it. Yeah. I'm getting some Strang strangulation. 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 There was something about a stra strangulation. That's what we sense. Mm -hmm. Yes, there was. How it there was. Yeah, too. exactly. Her sure. hyoid bone yeah. was broken, but broken. they couldn't tell. There was we nothing. Think it was her we think so too. Husband? Yes. Picking up an awful lot of negative energy here. I feel awful talking I about know, this guy. I know. When I tune into the energy, it feels almost evil. She wasn't killed in the desert. She wasn't she killed in the desert. She was not no. killed there. Not killed there. I was not killed there. Oh my God. But there was other violence that took place. Yeah, like he night. was beating her up and yes. it wasn't the first time. My sense is that Stephanie was killed somewhere else. There was a struggle and it happened quite a distance from here. Mm -hmm. And uh, when he brought her into this remote place, I feel like he made up some story about why he was here, but the only reason was to Don't. put her body here. <laughs> We're gonna go to Pima now to look at the trailer that Stephanie and Andres lived in. I've noticed that people move in and out of it, in and out of it. Nobody stays long. Andres and Stephanie lived in it for several years. Mm -hmm. And uh, she was living here when she disappeared. Let's go in. I've never had the opportunity to go into the trailer. <sighs> I automatically felt very nauseated. And we all had the same knots in our stomach kind of feeling. There's a lot of chaos energy in this mm -hmm. trailer. And it was a strangling. Oh, God bless It you. was a strangling. It was not an overdose. Very, very clearly she's saying that. They had an argument. But I think he pushed it. He pushed her a lot. Yeah. He forced arguments a lot. He was very violent. Uh, and I think he hit her. Did you see bruises on her at times? Yeah, I know he hit her. I know yeah. he would mm -hmm. hit her. It was an icky, creepy, awful feeling. I wanted that place, that trailer to be torched. I thought that that was the darkest place I'd ever been in. And yet at the same time, there was an exalted feeling of, thank goodness, this is a powerful healing. We understand what happened. Now we can move on free of the past, the shackles of those horrible memories. I've wanted to come in this room for 18 years. Mm -hmm. I'm glad we came here. So am I. There's always a karmic justice that is done. Mm -hmm. We may not see justice in the way we want to see it in our lifetime, but there is karmic justice. It had to unfold, be and unfold just in the way it did, exactly in that way. She doesn't know why, but her, her guides are telling her that. She's forgiven him. She's forgiven him. And she wants everybody else to forgive. Andreas, forgive. She keeps writing, forgive him. I think they were right on. I'm amazed with them, and uh, they could just see everything that happened. They just picked up on our stuff, our feelings. They just hit on so much, so much that rang so true. 
What an amazing experience it was to go into those locations. It's like really, really negative, dark energy that you're stepping into when you deal with this yeah. type of thing. It's this toxic energy field. When they said that she was strangled, it was kind of strange too because that it was brought up in the autopsy. It surprised me that they knew about the hyoid bone. It was just amazing. You know, we're not making accusations here. We're really just giving our impressions. Norma and Misty are such an amazing, heroic example of how to stand up for yourself and fight. I feel honored that they have confidence in us, that you know we can move on and we have great things in our future. And I know all of this was with the help of them, obviously, and Stephanie intervening. This is a step in the right direction. It's going to make us stronger. Absolutely, yeah. Finally, Norma and Misty have a sense of peace about this for the first time in over 20 years, probably. It's validated that Stephanie yeah. wants us to just go, go. just yeah. do our life, just have our life and be happy. I think today will help me open up to people more than I have. I think this was her way of telling us, stop, don't obsess about it. Just live your life. It, it will, it, it's okay, it's okay.